Amen. All right, here in Genesis chapter number 3, an easy summary or a very basic summary of this chapter would be, of course, the fall of mankind. That's what we read about here in Genesis chapter number 3. And we begin with the serpent or the devil being introduced for the very first time in verse number 1 here in Genesis chapter number 3. Verse number 1, the Bible reads, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, as God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now I want you to keep your hand here. Let's go back to uh, Revelation chapter number 12. Revelation chapter number 12. Now, a lot of things we take for granted. We take for granted the fact that we know that the serpent is the devil, of course, right? But we need to be able to prove that to people. We need to understand where the Bible teaches that. This may seem very basic, but if I asked you to show me a verse and prove to me that this is Satan or this is the devil, would you be able to do so? Things like this are very important. We're going through a chapter. It allows us to do an exhaustive study. It allows us to study a chapter and to not leave any stones unturned. And that's what we're going to do. I want to define this. We have children here, of course. And, you know, even simple things that we take for granted, they need to learn. They need to know who the serpent is at a very young age and who this is that comes to mankind. I want you to look here in Genesis chapter number 12. I want you to look down verse number 9. I'm sorry, Revelation. I'm sorry. It's Revelation chapter number 12, of course. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, And the great dragon was cast out. Now watch this. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. So notice he defines for you, and not only that, he gives you a bunch of terms all at one time, and he ties all of these titles together. So every time we see Satan brought up, we know that that was Satan in the Garden of Eden. Every time... You know, we see the devil brought up. We see any of these terms. We see the dragon spoken of figuratively here throughout the book of Revelation. We know that that is the serpent from Genesis. Sometimes, like I said, you can take these things for granted. But it's important to be able to identify this and prove without a shadow of a doubt. Because you know what? Not in this case this wasn't so. But a lot of times you may have just received information and you just thought that it was true and it was actually false. So that's why you need to know for yourself, in your own mind, you need to prove all things and be able to show without a shadow of a doubt from Scripture what the answer is or what the interpretation thereof is. Amen. Look at verse number one again. I want you to notice this. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So the serpent we know now is speaking of the devil. I believe that the devil possessed this animal. And that actually happens in the New Testament when there's a man that is possessed. And they cry unto Jesus when Jesus is walking the earth. And they request for Jesus, you know, not to torment them at this time. And they say, just cast us into the swine. So there you have a, a realistic, an actual, you know, uh, a story that's told where devils, or the devil, if you will, devils, the devil, is possessing an animal. So this actually can happen. This actually does happen throughout the Bible. So now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. I want to look at that real quick. He was more subtle than any beast of the field. Keep your hand here. Let's go to one more passage. Here while I read verse number 1. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. I want to look at the subtlety of the serpent. <clears throat> referring to him being crafty. That's what it means to be subtle. It's referring to him being, he's deceitful. But it's a reference specifically to him being crafty. He doesn't just come right out and lie. He's very crafty with his lies. That's what subtle means. It does not only just mean deceitful. It means you are crafty when you deceive. Look there at 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. I want you to look at verse number 3. Because that verse that we just read is actually referenced by Paul. It says in verse number 3, chapter number 11 of 2 Corinthians. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve... Through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So this was still a real fear, fear that Paul had for those that were in the church of Corinth. Those that, that, that were Christians that Paul had discipled in some way or another. He feared that Satan still that day, thousands of years afterwards, would deceive them in the same way in which he had deceived Eve. 
Nothing is different today. Satan still goes around deceiving people, and Satan is still subtle. He does not just come right out. Once you go back and let's look at that, specifically how, how he is subtle right here in this passage in Genesis chapter 3. So it says he's more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat. Of every tree of the garden. Now I want to read verses 2 and 3. And then I want to come back and reference that last statement he made in verse number 1. Look at verse number 2 in chapter 3. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Let's go ahead and read verse 4 as well. And the serpent said, so the serpent responds. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now we can see Satan's subtlety right here. Did Satan just approach Eve immediately and say, Hey, Eve, do you know what God told you is not true? God actually lied to you. Would that be considered subtle if he came and just said that? You know, right out, he just blatantly lied right away. No, of course he comes first. And he asks the question, Yea, hath God said. And that's, that is Satan's number one device that he uses. The Bible says, I believe it's in 2 Corinthians 11 where we were before, it says that we are not ignorant of his devices. Right after it references how the, how the serpent beguiled Eve. So do you know the number one device that he uses? Do you know what Paul was actually worried about, about the Corinthians being deceived? Was that they would be deceived out of God's word. You know, it's immediately when he shows up, the very first thing that he says is yea, hath God said. What is he doing? He's casting doubt upon God's word. He's trying to get you to doubt what God has told you. And people still do that today. This isn't anything new. You know, all those, those common, you know, all the commentaries and all the references and all the little notes, like it's been like Schofield. I had a Schofield reference Bible and I didn't read the notes very often, but I knew where all of the, the variations were in the text. So I would look sometimes to see what Schofield said about it. Because it's a King James Bible, you know, he's, he's putting out a study Bible. And there are numerous times where he actually gives you information to say, hey, you know, you know, this actually is not in the original manuscripts. Or he'll make a statement or allude to the Alexandrian manuscripts. So it's not, it wasn't used in the Westcott and Hort Greek text that's supposedly more reliable. Why even bring that up? What's the point that you're even telling everyone that? You know why? To cast doubt upon God's word. You know what? That is subtle is really what it is. Right. He doesn't come right out and say, hey, this is an error. This is a problem in the King James Bible, which it's not. That's what he believed, obviously. Right. He doesn't just come right out and say, hey, this shouldn't be in the Bible. He includes it in your Bible, and then he just says, yea, if God said, is it really true? You decide. Here's some information, though, that may say that it's not. If he actually believed the King James Bible were perfect, he wouldn't even be bringing crap like that up. It's not even relevant. It's so ridiculous when you really look into it. It's so stupid, you would never believe something like that. You know, you don't. Re it just shows that people don't really believe God's word in the first place. You don't. It's, you know where you know where your starting point is. Psalm 12, 6 and seven. It just shows that his faith ultimately is not in the word of God. It's being. It's resting in you know man's wisdom. Is really what it is. So that's how that's how the, the you know the serpent works. That's how Satan works today. If you're going to be deceived today by Satan, he's going to deceive you. His devices are to deceive you out of the Word of God in some way. Because what is our stronghold? It's the Word of God. If you if you took away your if I took away your Bible, you'd have nothing. You have nothing. It's how you know how to get to heaven. It's everything. It is everything. It is the most important doctrine to value Baptist Church, and will forever be the most important doctrine. The King James Bible. Because if you, don't if you don't have the Bible, you don't know that salvation is by grace through faith. Right. If you don't have the Bible, you don't know anything. You know nothing. You don't know about Adam and Eve. You know nothing. You don't know about God. You may look and see who the Creator is, but you don't know who He is, what He's like. You know nothing about Him. If you don't have a Bible, you don't have anything. Nothing. So if God, if, or if Satan, that is, can take away your Bible, then you are left with nothing. Right. And not only that, even if you are saved, if he can deceive you out of certain scriptures, if he can take away your confidence and your boldness in the word of God, that God said this for sure. If he can just cast doubt in your mind, cause you, you know, to not be courageous, then he can take you out of the fight. 
You know, so we need to be confident in what God says. We need to put our faith in God's word and, ha and have boldness and know, you know, yes, this is what God said. Satan. Amen. You know, I, yeah, yes, it is. Look at what he, look at verse 2 again. Let's reread that. And the, whim, the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it lest ye die. Now what's interesting here is that there is, there's a little bit of a difference. If we go back and we read when God actually makes this statement, there's a little bit of a difference in this verse than when God made the statement in the original verse. Does anybody know right offhand what it is? Yeah. Neither shall ye touch it, right? That's actually not a part of the statement that was recorded when God gave the commandment. When God actually gave this commandment. Now, I'll tell you my thoughts on this that makes the most sense. In verse number three, three it says, but again, one more time, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Eve says this, God has said, ye shall not eat of it. And then she says, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So she, this is the impression that she's under that this is what God said, correct? She says, that ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So this is Eve speaking. Now, was Eve there when... when God gave the commandment unto Adam. She was not. So where is she getting her information from? From Adam, isn't she? Now I'll tell you the reason why. Uh, you know, I believe that that this is that this little small statement is added is because it, it's an extra buffer for Adam. You know, Adam's concerned. It's like it's it's kind of like this. It's like you know, I don't want kids going in. You know, let's say we got like a cake in there. That's not protected, right? And I say, no kids are allowed to go, there. No, no kids are allowed to touch the cake. You know what? Don't even go in the kitchen. You understand what I'm saying? So I believe what happened here is Adam probably just told Eve, hey, we're not allowed to eat of that tree. I don't believe he necessarily added, you know, not, not even necessarily, I don't believe he was adding to God's word. He was just telling Eve, hey, you know, you know, God said we're not allowed to touch that tree. We're not allowed to touch that tree. And then he just says, so, you know, no, I'm sorry. We're not allowed to eat of that tree. God said we're not allowed to eat of that tree. So just don't eat of it. Don't touch it. And then when Satan comes, you know, Eve is like, you know, neither shall we touch it lest we die. Because Adam's just like, don't even touch it. Stay away from the tree. No matter what you do, don't even look at it, right? So, because it's interesting, because that's not a coincidence. It's added no matter, no matter what. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, you know, however, this came from somewhere, this originated from somewhere, and it's not recorded. It's not, nothing's a coincidence. This statement is not recorded. And Eve was not there. So Adam relays the message, and he just adds this extra little, don't even touch it. Right? Look at verse number four. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. So he just outright just says God. He, what is he saying? saying, God's a liar. God lied to you. That's what he's saying. Ye shall not surely die. Look at verse 5. <clears throat> For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, one quick thing that I want to reference in verse number 4. I forgot to make this point. I wanted to make this point. You know, notice when the serpent, and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not true, that ye shall not surely die. Now, is that a true statement or, or is that false? That's false, right? So it's very important when you're reading through your Bible and you're studying your Bible, you need to differentiate between when man is speaking, when Satan is speaking, and when God is speaking. You know, there are lies in the Bible, but the Bible, as far as the author did not lie to you, there are lies that are recorded from man. There are lies that are recorded when the devil speaks, right? So there are, in the sense that there are lies contained in the Bible. Everyone understand what I'm saying? I said that for, for a shock factor there, so somebody can make a clip off of YouTube if they want to do it. So that statement right there, was it, was it was true that Satan said that, right? That was true, but what he said was false. So understand that when you're reading your Bible, whether or not it's man speaking, it's Satan speaking, whether or not man is speaking by the Holy Spirit, that's also a factor. So that's important. You need to know that. Right, that's a good example of rightly dividing. And a true good example of rightly dividing. Man, you know, dividing things like that. Okay, so again, we're look at uh, verse number five now. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, is that a true statement or is that a false statement? It's false. 
but it's kind of true, isn't it? And that's how every lie is. No one just comes right out and just says a blatant lie that's just like, uh, you know, that's so obvious that no one would fall for it. People that are intending, you know, they're intending on deceiving someone, they always mix, you know, truth in with their lie. Just enough truth to bait someone, but enough lie to get what they want or to corrupt them, right? So he obviously gives this to her as something that would be enticing. You could be a god. And there are even religions today that still say this, the Mormons, right? You know, that this entices these people. You know, there's, you know, this is obviously the reason why, when Satan comes to that, it comes to her, that he brings this up. But you know what? It is true that their eyes will be open. And it is true that once they eat of it, they will know good and evil immediately, won't they? That's true. But will they be as gods? No. They won't be as gods. Now, they will be like God in the sense of now they know good and evil. But is there any sort of authority or power that comes with this? Because that's what he's deceiving them into. You understand? So there's a lot of truth there. Like a lot of truth. But then there's, of course, the lie that just turns it on its head. All it takes is one word to make something. You can have a whole long sentence and just put not in there, and it means exactly the opposite. All it takes is a little bit to make something totally corrupt and false. You know, the gospel is pure, of course, and it only takes... One phrase, repenting your sins, to just destroy the whole gospel. And now it's a false gospel. You know what I mean? So all it took was just that little statement, you shall be as gods. Saying you guys would be as if you were gods, right? Knowing good and evil. Look at what it says in verse number 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took up the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, I don't have this in my notes, and I may not be able to locate it, but I want you to turn to Romans 7. Let's look for this real quick. Romans chapter number 7. Yeah, verse number 7. You know what? That's not exactly what I'm looking for. There's a verse in the Bible... I thought it was in, that. That's actually, I think, where I confused it because they're very uh, similar. But there's a verse in the Bible that talks about, you know, uh, how how all sin starts with lust in the very beginning. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin hath conceived, it bringeth forth death. And what happened here, in the sense with, you know, uh, Adam and Eve? What happened exactly, specifically with Eve? What was the very beginning before she actually sinned? What does it say? It says, I want you to go, go back to Genesis chapter number 3, look at verse number 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes. And look at this, and a tree to be desired. What, is, what does it mean to desire something, to lust after it? Do you understand that? And a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took up the fruit thereof and did eat. So God, of course, gave them a command that you're not allowed to eat of this tree. And now they have eaten of it. This is the fall of mankind, the very first sin. And we can see even the consistency with the very first sin that lust, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin hath conceived, what followed after this? Death. In the day that ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. So we see that consistency here. So it says that the woman saw the tree, and she, so she's the one looking at it. She saw that it was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. So this tree was, it was, you know, delightful to look at. It was pleasurable to look at. And isn't it true that every sin in life almost is like that? The majority of the sins, they're, they're good to look at. They're good to think about for a season, right? They, people try to dress things up and make them look good. But really, in a spiritual sense, it's rotten and it's bad. And you know what the end, you know, the wages of that, you know what the result of that is? Death, ultimately. So it says that she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. It's interesting, after that it says this, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. These lousy women condemned all of mankind. No, I'm just kidding. Look at verse number seven. And the eyes of them both were opened. And they knew that they were naked. Now notice immediately the Bible, from the Bible's perspective now, the Holy Spirit chooses to use the exact same words that the devil used. Do you know why? 
to tell you that he wasn't completely lying to them. God could have worded this in a different way, could, couldn't he have? You know what he says? Immediately their eyes were opened. Isn't that what Satan actually said was going to happen? Yeah, because he wasn't just fully lying to them. He was telling them, you know, a lot of it was the truth. Partially it was true. So their eyes were opened and they, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Keep your hand here and go to 1 Timothy chapter number 2. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. We're going to reference a couple of passages here. So the story of Adam and Eve is actually referenced a few different times. We saw 2 Corinthians 11, and we saw the serpent being referenced. Whoops. So it's 2 Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy? Because it's 1 Timothy. Yeah, 1 Timothy chapter 2 is where it's at. And it's verse number... I want you to look at verse number 13. The Bible says, For Adam was first formed, then Eve. So Adam was made first and then Eve, because we know that that's actually... You know, what woman means, she was made out of man, she was made from his rib. Look at verse 14. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, was in the transgression. Now, you know, it, it, it's very interesting just how the New Testament sheds so much light on the Old Testament. And you can learn things that aren't very clear when you read in the Old Testament, you can learn them from the New Testament. Like this truth here. You know, but you can actually still learn of this. You can learn this, this truth even from... Uh, Genesis chapter number 3, because I want you to look here at, look, skip down and look at verse 12, when the man responds to God, when God is interrogating him about sinning. He says this, and the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be, to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. So does he mention anything about being deceived or anything like that? He just says, she gave it to me and I ate it. But he knew he wasn't supposed to eat of it, right? Look at, look, at, look at Eve's response. Verse 13, And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Notice that you can still learn this truth even from the Old Testament. She actually says, I was beguiled, which means deceived. That's the same word that's used in 2 Corinthians 11 when he talks about that the serpent would beguile you as, as the serpent beguiled Eve. So you can still learn this truth. He admits to it, but he still tries to kind of pass the buck there. So look at verse 7, you know, it says, and, and, the, and the eyes of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. I want to reference one more passage, very interesting. I want you to go to Job chapter number 31. Job chapter number 31. Job, chapter number 31. I'll get into there myself. I believe it's verse 33. Yeah, verse 33. He says, If I covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. Anybody ever notice that this was referenced? Isn't that interesting? Because the book of Job, when you study the timeline... It's interesting because it seems as if he was there at the time of Abraham. There's a few different factors. There's a few different reasons why that seems to be so. I'm not going to go into them right now. But that shows that, that even at that time, they knew about the story of Adam, which we knew that already. But it's good to have biblical evidence where they're pointing to Scripture. Where we can see Job is referencing Scripture. So he had some you know, sense, whether it was oral like a lot of people think. He knew the scriptures. He knew what happened in the you know, in you know, the Garden of Eden, and he understood what what actually Adam was doing when he made the aprons. Because look at what it says. One more time, read a few times. We're focused on different things in the verse each time. Look at the very end there. It says, "And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons." So immediately when they eat of this, they know they're naked. They feel uncomfortable being naked. And I believe that this is a good way to tell, you know, how children get to the age where they're no longer innocent, where they actually understand sin. Where they sin, and they understand that it's wrong, is when they understand that they shouldn't be naked. It's a perfect example, because that's, that's what, you, know, you should just walk around naked, because a lot of kids will just, Jeremiah is bad at this real, right now, real bad. He just runs around constantly with no clothes on. I come home from work. And he has zero clothes on sometimes. Like, get some clothes on. He just doesn't have a clue, right? So kids will just walk, because they're innocent, right? They'll just walk around just butt naked. And you're like, go get some clothes on. You're making me feel uncomfortable. No, I'm just kidding. But see, 
that's because they don't understand. They're in the same stage that Adam and Eve were in. They were innocent. They didn't know right from wrong. They didn't know good and evil. You know, they didn't understand that. And then once they had sinned, what happened? The sin came, you know, when, just like Paul says, when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. There's a change that takes place. It says that their eyes were opened. So they understood things and knew things, right, that they didn't know before, right? You know, you hear people talk about being enlightened, you know? That's not always a good thing. Talking about, so the other day somebody mentioned that they were talking to somebody and they got their third eye. Who was that? Who said that? They, that's, not, that's not a good thing. You know what I mean? And you look at that kind of stuff and it's wicked and it's evil. And they're like, I've been enlightened, I got my third eye. Yeah, kind of like Adam and Eve probably. That's probably what happened. You know evil things now, right? You know things that you shouldn't know, right? You're becoming less and less, you know, innocent in areas where you should, things you should never know. Be simple. Be simple concerning evil. Don't, I don't even want to know about wicked things. Don't even tell me about bad things, Amen. right? The, I'll, you, don't, you, well, you can learn from it. No, 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 no. I'll use the Bible. The Bible will teach me. This is all I need to help me to learn and walk, walk the right path. I don't need you to tell me about a bad example and the detail, the gory details of it. There's a reason why the Bible consistently uses euphemisms. You're supposed to be simple concerning evil. Yes. You know, so this is not a good thing. Their eyes are open. It's not a good thing. It's actually a bad thing, right? <clears throat> I want you to look at verse number 8. The Bible says, in the, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Isn't that interesting in verse number 8? And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. There you have the true trinity, the word of God. The I believe, whether I can explain this in every facet, I believe this is literal. I just believe the Bible. When it says they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day, that's literal. Amen. The word of God. Look at... Uh, it says in the cool of the day, and it says that they tried to hide themselves. Look at the end there. It says, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. You know, this is so foolish, of course, because you cannot hide from God. You know, what's the, the verse in Psalm? You know, it says, he that hath formed the ear, he that hath made the ear, shall he not hear? He that hath formed the eye, shall he not see? You know, so God who made the eyeball, he designed the eyeball. People study, you know, how complex, it's the most complex, you know, uh, element to the human body. It's insane just how crazy the eyeball is. The way that it works, the way that we focus. I mean, look at just a camera, and that doesn't do even close to what the eyeball does. Right? God formed the eye. You think you're going to hide from him? Come on. The guy that actually created the eyeball... He's obviously far above and beyond the eyeball. Someone who creates a watch, they're greater than the watch, right? Yeah. Well, God who created the eyeball, he's far beyond the eyes that you see with. You know, his eyes, behold, you know, God beholds everything, the Bible says, good and evil. You know, David talks about, whither shall, I, whither shall I go to flee from thy presence? I make my, you know, I go to heaven, behold, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. God's everywhere. It's foolish for them to try to, you know, hide from God. Look at uh, verse number 9. The Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Does God know where he is? Yes. Of course, he's asking a rhetorical question. Jesus will do this a few different times. He'll ask questions about things that he already knows. You know, it talks about the one time when he's sitting and eating with Simon, the Pharisee. You know, uh, he knows his thoughts, and then he asks him a question about what he already knew. God will do that. He'll ask rhetorical questions for your sake to help you. That's what he's doing here. He's, he's getting to Adam to admit his wrong. He says, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. <clears throat> so notice he was afraid. He knew what he had done and that it was wrong. Verse 11, and he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? God already knew this, of course. It's a rhetorical question. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. So notice how he tries to just pass the buck. He admits that he ate of the tree, but the woman, he's like trying to pin it on two people. It's like, if one doesn't work, then the other will. 
That woman that you gave me, she gave me up. I mean, that's kind of scary to try to see, blame it on God. You know what I mean? I'd much rather blame it on my wife, right? <laughs> but he says, the woman which thou gavest me, she gave me of, of the tree, and I did eat. So he, he doesn't, this is how mankind always is, right? Men, women, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, it's hard to take responsibility sometimes. But you know what you need to do? You need to man up. Whether you're a man or a woman, you need to man up. You need to take responsibility when you do things that are wrong, because you'll never end up fixing your problems if you don't. If you don't admit you're a sinner, you'll never get saved. But if you don't admit you have a problem, whatever it may be, you'll never fix it. Right? You'll never get it right. If you never admit that you've lied to someone, well, you're never going to make that relationship right. There's always going to be that rift between the relationship. You always need to admit you're wrong and take responsibility for what you've done. Look at uh, <clears throat> verse number 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. That means deceive. And I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, Thou art cursed above all cattle. Notice he didn't ask the serpent, what hast thou done? It's because he knew what happened all along. He knew that it ended with the serpent. So once they said the serpent did it, God knew the whole story. Then he said, then he responds to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, I've, I, I remember I watched, uh, I can't remember the name of it right now. Maybe it's Bible Adventures. Has anyone ever heard of that? Well, uh, I think it's Bible Adventures. It's like from the 70s. Uh, it's, 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 like, uh, it's like the old version of like veggie, like the Christian, you know, kind of corny a little bit. But I think it's called Bible Adventures. You can YouTube it once you leave. And uh, they like, they're these architects or something, or they're archaeologists, and they're like, uh, they're studying things, and they find some like, like, uh, something that like, it's like a, that time warps them back to the time of the Bible. And each one, they just go through these stories in the Bible, and they go there. And one of the things that I remembered was uh, the one about Adam and Eve, was that they had the serpent. I remember this when I was a little, I mean, I'm talking like six, five, six, seven years old, we would watch this in, in, uh, downstairs in children's church. And they had him with, with legs. Which I think that that's very possible. Because the curse is something's changing where now I'm bringing you down to the level where you're going to be eating dust from this point going forward. There's something that changed. When women hear a curse, something changes, right? The, you know, he, he causes there something you know, to change. The man, he curses the ground, right? The ground is cursed. So he actually does you know, do something. So obviously there's a change that takes place here. And in this case... You know, the, the, the liberal Christian cartoons could have been right. It's very possible. You know, he tells them that the curse is, I'm going to curse you above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. All the snakes that came after this one serpent that got possessed by the devil are like, man, what did you do to us, right? They're, they, you know, they, they could did, uh, you know, uh, complain about Satan doing this to them as well. I believe that God, that he, that he uh, just to explain this concept, because it may seem weird to people, like, why would he do it to the snake? Because the snake didn't really do anything. It was, the, it was Satan who actually you know, possessed the serpent. God says that he puts signs in the skies and things like that. And I believe that God actually did this to that serpent you know, forever as a sign to all mankind that they slither on the ground. And what happens all the time? People step on them. That's a picture of the Messiah coming that will one day, st you know, stomp the head or tread down the heads of the serpents. Because there's a real reason why God did it. You know, obviously all the snakes are not literally serpents. and They're not all literally the devil. So why would he curse all serpents going forward from this point forward? To be a sign. Because he's going to, in the future, you know, Jesus Christ... God manifest in the flesh will tread upon the serpents. And that's a sign to all mankind and reminding you, just like the uh, rainbow in the sky is a sign of God's promise. He does these types of things. It's a token. So it's a sign. That's why. Because people can think. I remember uh, people asking. I remember my uncle particularly one time asked, like, why, why did God, like, you know, curse the serpents? Because it's like, we know that it's actually the devil, but how does this work? And I didn't really have an answer at that time, but I thought about it. Since in reading the Bible, I see God uses these things as signs. So... He curses the snakes. It would make sense that they had legs. And now, from this point forward, they're eating dust. They weren't eating dust before. So now they are you know, on the ground. I believe they don't have 
legs anymore. It could be like, uh, you know, it could have been just, just God made only lizard type reptiles, you know. And then there was a specific one, maybe, you know, specific, specific few in which he cursed them. That could be what it is. I don't know exactly how it worked. But look at verse 15. It says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman. So enmity is like animosity. It's the feeling of an enemy. That's why it's similar to the word enemy. You know, between thee, so that's talking about Satan, and between thy seed, that's a reference to the Antichrist, and, and, and her seed. So there will be enmity or a feeling of animosity of, or being an enemy between the Satan's seed, which is, of course, the Antichrist, and Eve's seed, which we know to be you know, referring to the Christ, Jesus. And then it says, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. We know this is a fulfillment of Jesus Christ treading down Satan, defeating death and hell and Satan, ultimately. Look at verse number 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. We're not going to go over this right now. We may look at it in a chapter to come, but of course we know that the punishment is twofold here. Number one, it is specifically that women are going to bring forth children in great sorrow. You know, it's great labor. Obviously, there's an extreme amount of pain when children are born. And he multiplied that. He made it worse, right? He made it worse, specifically. So that almost makes it seem as if she was going to have children before that. You know, I don't exactly understand her. She was designed to have children. He's saying, I'm going to multiply your sorrow. I'm going to make it worse than what it is now is what I'm saying. I'm going to multiply it, and you're going to bring forth children, you know, he says, in sorrow, and the conception is going to be in sorrow. And he says, in sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. And then he says this, this is the other part, and thy desire, <clears throat> and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So that's the other part of the punishment is that the man is the loss. But, you know, with that, obviously, there comes more responsibility for the man. That's why Adam is referenced first. When God comes, he speaks to Adam first. He says, hey, Adam, you know, what happened? Because the man is the one that needs to answer for his household. If there's a problem that, that is, you know, something that really goes wrong in a church or something, the men really need to discuss it. If there's two families that are having, you know, it out and there's some issue and it, 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 it excels where it's a big problem... The men need to go and speak to each other. That's how it should operate. The men are the ones that answer for their family. So that means if your family fails, it's your fault. No matter what, if your family fails, it's your fault. So you are, it is your job to be the head of the household and to make the right decisions and be the boss. You know, you need to, you know, you need to rear your children properly. You are the head of the household. You're the one that answers for your children. You're going to stand before God and answer for your children one day. You're going to stand before God and answer for your wives one day. So you need to take that seriously. Just like Adam stood there and answered for what happened in his family. You know, him and his wife at that moment. So, uh, I want, I, I notice that statement. I want to look at this real quick. That statement says, And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. I want you to turn over to Genesis chapter number 4, verse number 4. I don't have a real clear answer for you. I have a couple of ideas you know, a few ideas of what this means, but this statement is found one other time. Very similar statement is found one other time in the Bible. Genesis chapter 4, just the very next passage, when Abel and Cain bring their offering, it says in verse, we'll just read just that particular verse, I believe it's 7, yeah. If thou doest well, speaking to Cain, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And then he says this, and unto thee shall be his desire and thou shalt rule over him. Now, I'm not going to tell you. Can, we can speak about it afterwards if you're interested. But I'll tell you a couple of the ideas that I have. Because this is kind of, it's, it's, it's worded strangely right there. And it's hard to figure out what that means. But, you know, it's, I, it's always better to have statements a few different times in the Bible. And then you can study and compare and cross-reference. And that's how you figure out. That's how you find the definition to a word. Just look that word up a few times. Normally, it's the first time that it comes up. So you can look at that too and try to figure out what that actually means, but you see almost that exact same statement. So that's interesting that that, that is used only twice right there. You know, one chapter away from one another. Go back, verse number 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow 
shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Verse 18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. So what's he saying? You're going to die. That's what he's telling him. This is where he's pronouncing death upon mankind. Until till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. That is death pronounced upon mankind going forward from this point forward. That's when God actually said, you know, he told him prior, in the day that ye eat thereof, you're, you will die. Thou shalt surely die. People think God is a joke. Seriously. People think God is a pushover. And that you can just do whatever you want. They have this weird picture of God in their mind. And it doesn't matter how you live your life. He'll just accept you no matter what. That is not the God of the Bible. God said, don't eat of the tree or you're going to die. And you know what happened? He cursed all of mankind. He cursed the man. He cursed the woman. He cursed the serpent. And he cursed the lamb. And he said, you're going to die. And guess what happened? They died. They died spiritually immediately, and they died physically later. All these people that think that they're just going to go through life, you know, dwelling upon themselves, their own interests, you know, just living out all of their own lust and doing whatever they want in their life, they have a major surprise coming at the end of their life. Because God is not a joke. He is a God of judgment. And if God says, if you sin against me, I have a way out. Just put your trust in me, but you don't believe in him, you're going to go to hell. Guess what's going to happen? You're going to go to hell. Right. All of the, or Everyone that does not trust God to save them, does not trust Jesus Christ to save them, will burn in hell for all eternity. Just like God said, if you eat of the tree, you'll die. If you don't believe in Jesus, you'll go to hell and you'll die and you'll burn for all eternity. Just like when God says here, don't eat of it, and then what happens? Well, let's test the waters. Let's see what happens. Let's eat of it anyway. They ate, they died. People say, oh, are you sure I'll go to hell? I wouldn't test it. Because I can, I can tell you that God's word is true. I can tell you that this passage here, Genesis chapter number 2, when he gives them the warning, that's just as true as Revelation 21.8. Both of them. The same God. And you know, not only that, there are punishments in life. God will punish you in life. Your kids think that they're going, to, they're going to get away with things. Teenagers think they're going to get away with things. And adults sometimes think they're going to get away with things. God is not a pushover. Right. And children need to understand this as well. You know, you think that you can just go through life sinning against God. You, and, you don't, and you're not going to get some sort of, you know, repercussions. you got another thing coming to you. Yeah, especially the kids that grow up in this church that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They get to hear the preaching constantly. They read their Bibles. They see, they've read or memorized Exodus chapter number 20. If you've memorized Exodus chapter number 20, you are that much more liable. You're held at a higher standard. All the children in here, if you, if you know and you hear constantly, lying's wrong. You get to hear the preaching. You know all these things. God will punish you just like he punished Adam and Eve. God is not a joke. And you think, oh, I'm just going to get away with all this. No, you're not. Right. No, you're not. Adam and Eve are just like, oh, let's just eat of it anyways. You know, let's just do it anyway. Let's just see what happens. You'll die. You'll die. He is a God of judgment. And he's, he's, here's the thing. He spared not his own son. You think he's going to let you just get out free? You know, all those that don't believe in Jesus, he spared his own son. He spared not his own son, I'm sorry. He spared not his own son. He spared not his own son. And you think after he, you know, let his son die on the cross, you really think that he's just going to be like, all right, just come in. You're going to burn in hell. That's scary. You are, you know, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to burn in hell for all eternity. Right. And just like God cursed the ground when he said he was going to, he'll curse you in hell for all eternity. And just like God says he'll punish Christians if they live a disobedient life, whether they be adults, teenagers, or just children, he will, he will punish you. He will chastise you. You will not get away with it. Right. God is not a joke. That's what you can learn from this. 
You constantly see that. Even with Malachi, we saw our, he's fearful, he's dreadful. You know, you need to be afraid of God. He is not this God that the majority of Christianity portrays. They're wrong. They don't understand his character. They don't understand who he is. He's not to be fooled with. Take God serious. Amen. That's why, that's why, you know, he, we treat him as though he's, he's holy because he is holy. He's, you know, he, he's just so much beyond us, right? You need to be afraid of God. You need to fear God. You need to be afraid. You need to think about what God will do to you if you commit such a sin. You need to fear the God of the Bible. You can see the, you know, the power when he's cursing mankind here. He has all authority of all things. Think about that. And, he, and he, he gives this curse out to mankind. And he tells them, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. That's for their sin. Just like I told you, Adam, you're going to die. Could Adam have said, please, 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 no. Please, just give me another chance. Was that possible? It's too late. It's too late. You don't get another opportunity. It's too late. Think about that. As far as, you know, obviously, we're going to read here in a minute, and God shows them mercy, but they die, like he said so. God will not be a liar for you. God will not you know, just break his commandments and all of the things that he said. If he said you're going to die, you're going to die. If he said, you know, don't do that, I'll punish you, I'm going to chastise you, he will. It will happen, I promise you. Look at verse number 20. And Adam called his wife's name... Eve, because she was the mother of all living. So what can we learn from that right there when it says because? We learn that that's what Eve actually means. You see that pattern in the Bible? It's actually telling you that he called her Eve because she was the mother of all living. So he, he's calling her that because she was the mother of all living because Eve actually means the mother of all living. You have to think of Eve is you know, the, the progenitor of every single person that walks on this earth. That's super interesting. Every single person, your great, 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 multiplied by numerous times, grandmother is Eve. Just like mine is, yours, everybody's. That's Amen. interesting. Amen. Look at uh, verse 21, very important. <clears throat> Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Well, I thought they were already clothed. They were, but do you remember that verse in Job said? That Adam tried to hide his sin in his bosom. So he still had it. That's a picture of, you know, of man just trying to rehabilitate himself without God. That's a picture of man just trying to just repent of his sins without God. He just tries to fix the problem, doesn't he? What is he doing? He's just hiding the sin that's still there. It actually wasn't taken away, right? The sin wasn't actually taken away. He, this is a picture of man's works. They had to make these aprons. But you know what happened when... When they were given the coats of skins, what are the, what are the coats of skins made from? Made from an animal, a lamb, I believe. You know what? Just like God told uh, you know uh, Abraham, he said it says God will provide Himself a lamb. You know what He did? God provided this lamb. They tried to make their own aprons with their own works, and they tried to hide their sin, right? But that wasn't good enough. He said, "Take that off. I'll give you something that will actually fix the problem." You know why? Because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Something has to die. Again, this goes back to God being a just God. God being a just God. You know, I, people kind of get hung up on this and they're out soul winning sometimes. They don't understand. Well, why? Did, Muslims say this all the time. This, it, it, this, is, it, this aggravates me because it's just, it's, it's, it's logical. Because the God is, you know, God is the God of wisdom, of logic, right? It's, it makes perfect sense. If God is a righteous God, if he's a God of, just, of justice, right? And he says, you are going to die because of your sin. Muslims always say, why doesn't he just forgive them? Just forgive them and then, then they can go. Well, he, he already pronounced the punishment, right? And what is the punishment? The punishment is death for sin. So, so either you die or somebody else does. So that is the, God cannot just not punish, right? He ha it's, it's just. What it's right. You think it's just you think it's just, you know, a serial killer could just go around and murder everybody, kill, you know, 70, 80 people, and then he's like, oh, he gets on his hands and he's please, 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 and they're like, okay, I forgive you. Just go live your life. 
You think that's justice? You have a warped view of, of reality of what's right and wrong if you think that's justice. Right. God is a just God, and there is a penalty to be paid when you do something wrong. There's a penalty, and it has to be paid. Something had to die. Yeah. Something had to die. Right? So he killed something, and in this case, this was just a picture of the Lamb of God, Amen. of the Lord Jesus Christ. But do you know, you say, well, well, how did Adam and Eve get to heaven? They believed God, and it was counted unto them, for, unto them yeah, in this case, for righteousness. But what did they believe? Look there in verse number 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And then it says this, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's the very first promise that the Messiah would redeem mankind. That's what, that, that's what that means. And they understood what that means. That's quoted in Romans 16 to say that you through Christ will defeat Satan one day, who has the key of death and hell. And they understood that. God gave them. They heard the gospel. And then, and then they trusted God, that God would provide that Messiah. You know what he did? He provided the lamb, a secondary picture of that. Right afterwards, he gives them the lamb, which is a picture of, did they, you know, here's the thing. The aprons could have covered their nakedness just as well as far as just being a covering in the sense of, you know, visually you could have looked at them and it could have covered them just as well. I'm sure God would tailor it and make it look better, right? Because, he, you know, he's the God of creation. Anything he does is going to be better when man does it. But as far as just being covered, they could have done just as good, right? They could have just covered themselves from head to toe. They would have been totally covered as far as their nakedness, right? So the reason why he made them these coats of skins obviously isn't so that he actually made sure that their nakedness was covered. Do you understand what I'm saying? The reason was to be a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the Lamb of God. When Jesus showed up, you know, John the Baptist said, the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's what this picture, when he, when he made them coats of skins. Amen. Something had to die. What they had was not good enough. There's no blood. It had to picture, you know, the real sacrifice that was to come. So they obviously put their trust in God here again. As we see in verse number 21, he clothed them. You know, he clothed them with this was a, this is a picture of their righteousness, and he actually took away their sin. Adam just hid his sin, right, like Job said, but he took away their sins here. Amen. Verse number 22, it says this, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat, and live forever. This is the verse the Trinitarians think they just, they got you. Oh, you explained Genesis 1, 26. What about Genesis 3, 22? So it's like, they're got you, right? And they'll say, see, what does one of us mean? Well, that means there must be three. Yeah, I agree that there's three. No one denies that. We are Trinitarians. There are three that bear record in heaven. And there is, a, there is an eternal distinction between the three. And I've said this before, and we have to make sure... You know, that we don't go too far to one side or the other, right? Because sometimes when you're fighting someone, it can cause you to move way too far away in the opposite direction, way too far away. We are Trinitarians. I am a Trinitarian. I believe that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. There is a distinction. There truly is a distinction. There's a difference. You know, the Father's Spirit, right, is the Holy Spirit. So, of course... He is his own spirit, but guess what? There is a difference between the Holy Spirit and the Father in heaven. There is. Whether I can explain to you every difference, what it is, but there's a difference. There's obviously a difference when God sends his spirit. He sends the Holy Spirit, and it comes upon people, and they speak, right? And, you know, in an unknown tongue, whatever this tongue may be, you know, they speak in another language. When, uh, when that happens, there's obvi obviously a difference. There's, uh, let's use this as an example. Here's a perfect example. When the Holy Spirit descended like a bodily dove, right? In a bodily form like a dove, right? When that took place, someone looked and saw that, right? John says that he did, right? So he saw it. Is that the same as when Moses looked upon God in the Old Testament? It's not. There's a difference, isn't there? So just, just by comparing the two scriptures, there's a distinction. But does that equal a different person? No, the Bible says there's God is one person. Amen. So let's start with the clear scripture. God's one person. We have two scriptures that say so. God refers to the Holy Spirit as his spirit. We're grieving God. We grieve the Holy Spirit. You can prove that the Holy Spirit is Christ, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. We, we see the Bible says the word was God, the word was with God. I mean, let's, let's, 
puts you know, all this together, we can see, oh, there's one person. But there is a distinction between the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost. You compare it, we can see, all oh, the Word is literally God. And it is the literal Word of God. By looking at John 1, 1 through 3, and then Genesis 1. Right? It's interesting because these statements are only made early on in the book of Genesis. And then almost no statements, I think no statements, maybe one in Isaiah, maybe. It, it depends on your interpretation of that. Because that, even amongst like hard shell or uh, Trinitarians, is debated. But it's only made here a few times in the book of Genesis. I, like I said before, I believe that this is to reveal God's uh, you know, triune nature. That he is three. So don't, now I, I said that again to say this. He obviously wants you to know something if these statements keep coming up. That God is triune. So don't neglect that and go way too far in the opposite direction. God is triune. We believe in the Trinity. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. There is a distinction between the three. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. But it's not a distinction of persons. Right. Our foundation are the hundreds of times when God says, Even I am He, I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I lift up my hand, the word came out of my mouth. My hands, just repeatedly, it's a singular person. Then we see the triune nature said to be the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. So when we go to passages like this, we interpret the unclear scripture in light of the clear scripture every time. Amen. And somebody would look at this and say, oh, the Lord God said, behold, the man has become as one of us. How in the world? So maybe you explain Genesis 126, but how in the world do you explain, you know, Genesis 3.22, that the word of God knows good and evil? Go to Hebrews chapter number 4. Go to Hebrews chapter number 4. Here's the thing. The word of God is alive. It's not a separate person, but the word of God is living. It is God. Amen. Hebrews chapter number 4, verse number 12. The Bible says this, For the word of God is quick. What does that mean? Alive. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And then look what it says next. This is really important. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. Now watch this. And is a discerner. Do you know what that means? And is a discerner of the thoughts of and intents of the heart. Is this a different person? No. Is this a person it's talking about? No, it's the word of God, literally. Amen. The literal word of God discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. That what? Whether they're good or whether they're evil. Think about that. Think about that for a minute. Amen. Oh, we got it! No. This is biblical. It's biblical that the word of God is alive. And the Word of God discerns things. When you're reading this book, it's reading you. When you are reading this book, it, it understands the thoughts and the intents of your heart. Seriously. It is, you need to understand it's like literally, a, it's living. Amen. It's alive. It's not a separate mind other than God. Because the Word is God. Amen. It's one mind still. Because that same God in heaven, He is these words right here. He, he, he is the Word of God. That's right. It's not a second person. So, does that bother me when he says, you know, that man has become as one of us, knowing good and evil? Does it mean that there are two people? No. He's revealing his triune nature, and the Word of God discerns good and evil. The Word of God knows right and wrong. The Word of God is God. And God speaks there in plurality to discern, to, uh, to reveal his triune nature. That's why it shows up early on you know, in the book of Genesis a few times, because he wants to tell you about himself, right? So he, he reveals that he does have a triune nature, and there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Every, all of these things, all of just the, the few scriptures that people will use, they can be explained with scripture every time. And you know what? It's not just, oh, you just search for an answer. No, it lines up perfectly. It's a verse that actually says the word of God is alive and it discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart, whether it's right or wrong, whether it's good or evil. It's clear as day. Amen. Look at verse number 23. Well, I want to make a point that's real interesting about the end of verse number 22, if you ever thought about this. It says, Behold, the man has become of one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life. And eat and live forever. There, and then it says, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden. It's an interesting thought to think that God had to keep man away from that tree. You know, 
Is there a way to get access to the tree? Of course, when you go to heaven, right? You know, and the Bible says in paradise, the tree of life is there. So there's, what's the difference between now and then? That Adam was still in his corrupt body. So, you know, you can't prove this without a shadow of a doubt, but you can't, I can't prove this. Let's say this first. Obviously, God did not want man to eat of that tree in a fallen state. I mean, he, he sent him away from it so that he wasn't able to eat of it. So that means that something would have happened. You understand what I'm saying? Something would have happened, and it's a strange idea if you think, and obviously God would have never allowed this to happen. But if man would have eaten of that tree in a fallen state, he would just eternally been in like this flesh body, just a sinner. It's, it, you understand what I'm saying? Obviously God didn't design the world that way. God wouldn't have allowed it to happen. God controls all things. And he made this, but it's like, here's my point. He didn't, he didn't get, keep them away from that tree for no reason. There was a reason. He said, don't eat it. And he even says, let's eat of it and live forever. So what would have happened if he would have eaten of it? He would have lived forever. Just, and in the fallen state. So that's what, that is what this is teaching. It's a strange concept, but that is what this is teaching. You know, it, it, obviously man has to die first. That body has to go back to dust like God promised. And then... God has a plan where he will give you a new body. And then in this new body, once you're glorified, then you can eat of that fruit for all eternity. Look at verse 23. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. This, I believe, strongly is the first time it ever rains. I don't believe that the first time it rains is when Noah's flood took place. Most people have heard that. I believe right now, you say, why? Keep your hand here. Go back over to Genesis chapter number 2. I want you to look at verse number... Look at verse number 4 because we read this. I told you how all this was connected together. Look at verse number 4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. Now watch this. And there was not a man until the ground. So notice there it says that he had not caused it to rain upon the earth. Why? Because there wasn't a man to till the ground. Now go back to Genesis chapter number 3. Verse number 23, it says, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So wouldn't it make perfect sense that the reason why it didn't rain, because there wasn't a man to till the ground, you know, wouldn't it make perfect sense that once there was a man to till the ground, the whole purpose is that that's when it started raining. Everyone see that connection there? That's when, this is the point in which it started raining. As soon as there's a man to till the ground, now God, you know, that's the only reason why it wasn't raining. So once there is a man to till the ground, once he's working, and now, now he has to work harder. It makes perfect sense that if you look around the state of the earth today, there's not water that comes out. You know, that's, think about this too. I just thought of this. This just popped into my mind. Uh, when someone wants to have a pristine lawn, what do they have? They have sprinklers that just lawn the ground. I just thought of that. They just continually, you know, uh, waters everything. It makes it perfect. But you know what God just did? He cursed the ground. So now that water that was coming up out of the earth, no more. Now I'm going to make it rain. It's going to be much harder to, to, to work, to get things to grow. And you're going to have to go and till the ground. Because there's going to be seasons in which you can work, seasons in which you can't. And you're going to, it's up to you you know, to, to get this to grow. And that, you know, I didn't focus on that, but that's important. Men, you know, need to enjoy working. You need to enjoy working. You need, you need to understand that you are designed to work even before God, you know, uh, cursed man and, put, and made man's job even harder. They were still created to work. They, they were working and dressing the garden even when they were in the garden of Eden in paradise. <clears throat> so this is when it first rained. I strongly believe that. Look at verse number 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. This verse one I read all the time is a sad verse. Because if you think about this, you've got to really you know, meditate upon the word of God. You know, God came down to speak to Adam. You think that's the first time? I would say he did it all the time. I'd say God came down and just talked to Adam, maybe daily, maybe every few hours. You never know how often he came down. And they would just talk. And Adam got to know God on a much more personal level than you and I do. You understand what I'm saying? Adam 
Caleb really got to know God, and he spoke to him. God came down. He said he heard the voice of the Lord, you know, walking in the cool of the day. The, the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. Adam knew God, but do you know what happened? He basically was, that, that relationship was, was, you know, limited at this point. Where he's not in the Garden of Eden, he's not in paradise. He's not, you know, you know, the Bible talks about when it describes heaven that the Lord dwells there. Right? There was a major difference, there was a major disconnect between Adam's relationship, you know, with God at this point. Between Adam and Eve as well, of course, and God. And that's sad, isn't it? You know, I love God, I want to have a close relationship with Him. And it's a sad thought to think that, you know, that you're, that you're in a place, and you can, this can apply to you too, and I want to end with this. This can apply to you too. Maybe not in the exact same sense, and maybe, maybe not as extreme, but we have fellowship with God. The Bible talks about us having fellowship with God. And you know what we have that fellowship? We walk in the light as He is in the light. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. But you know what? If you're not walking in the light, you're not in fellowship with God. And just like Adam fell out of fellowship, in a sense, or at least the, the, you know, the strong fellowship that he had because of sin, if you get out of the light and you get into sin, you get into darkness, you'll fall out of fellowship with God too. That's sad. God loves us. He wants that relationship. You know, he's done so much for us. And, of course, the, you know, the most that he could have done. Of course, he took our punishment for us just to bring. Think about that. This everything points to Jesus. You may get tired of me saying it, but if you plan on staying here, I'm going to keep saying it over and over again. Everything points to Jesus. Amen. Do you know what remedy? What the remedy for this was? Jesus Christ dying on the cross. Amen. This is the fall of mankind. This is setting up the whole purpose and plan for all of mankind. You know what everything points to? Jesus. Everything. Right. You know. Atheists are like, why did God put that, that tree right in there in the middle of the garden? You know, obviously, God, you know, there's two reasons. God, number one, gives it man free will. He didn't just want to force them. He wanted to make, put a, make, at least make a, you know, put something there so that at least there was a decision to make. But you know what? God did know that they would eat of that tree. That's ultimately, God has foreknowledge. You know what? God was going to fix the problem immediately. And you know what it was? I'm going to come down and I'm going to take your punishment for you. Think about that. I think I mentioned this recently. All these atheists that bring this kind of stuff up. I think I said this Sunday morning. These types of dumb arguments. Where they're like, oh, you know, God just put that tree there. You know, so you know, they would eat of it and they would die. Yeah, well, you know what? When they ate of it and they died, their punishment he took, idiot. Right. Think about that. <laughs> yeah, he's not unfair. He took your punishment. You know, he's not unrighteous. Oh, he's just toying with people. Yeah, he's just toying with them. They eat of it. And then he says, you know what, Adam? Your punishment, I'm going to take it so you can come and live with me again. These guys, are, the atheists are just so clueless. Right. You know why? Because, you know, the beginning of wisdom begins with the Lord Jesus Christ. It begins with the Word of God. You know, so this is, the chapter number three is the summary of the fall of mankind. And just keep in mind... It's always point to what? Jesus. Jesus. Every time. It's always point to Jesus. God provided that sacrifice, and it was, of course, the, the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fire has to have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you so much for what you did for us, dear Heavenly Father. We ask that you be with us, and that you would give us the skills and the wisdom to add people into the church, dear Lord God, on your behalf, to go out and, and win souls on your behalf, and then also uh, to... Uh, to, to grow in wisdom and what we have to do to help people to change their lives. Just be with us. Help us to learn from every chapter on Wednesday nights, dear God. We thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the understanding through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen.